the quarterfinals of the first major of the 2020 tennis season. Believe it or not, we are finally there, and what an exciting place it is to be. And speaking of exciting places to be, I, I got to tell you about this. Peter Freeman from Crunch Time Coaching, uh, he just sent me a text. Uh, t- take a look. He is in Australia at the Australian Open, and apparently he has incredible seats. This was him watching Federer and his win over Martin Fuchovic. And Pete is there because he is the guest of the most interesting man in the world, in, in the tennis world, Steve Cantardi, who is the owner of the club at Harpers Point, a really cool tennis club in Cincinnati which is where Katie McNally uh, grew up and learned her tennis. Her mom is still a coach there. And if you don't know who Katie McNally is, uh, maybe you will remember her. She was the the young American girl who actually, uh, she was coming to net a lot, had a nice slice backhand and good volleys, and she was challenging Serena at the U.S. Open last year in one of the early rounds. I can't remember which. And uh, it was actually a really close match with uh, Katie McNally and Serena. But if you don't know who uh, Katie McNally is, you definitely know her doubles partner by now, Coco Gauff. And because Cantardi is so close to the McNally family, Cantardi and Pete were in the player box for their doubles match yesterday, and Peter Freeman told me he was literally high-fiving Coco's parents as they all cheered on uh, Katie McNally and Coco. So I had to share that with you. That's pretty cool. But for the rest of us normal people, though, who are uh, us suckers who are watching on TV around the world, it is still pretty exciting for us because we got Nick Kyrgios and Rafa. Didn't disappoint. Incredible match. I'll say John Millman and Federer was a little bit more uh, entertaining overall, but great match. Roger uh, Rafa proved he's the ultimate champion. Kyrgios proved he's always up to the challenge, and uh, it was it was great. But now we're on the verge of getting something even more special, and that would be the two men who have dominated the Australian Open in recent years. The only guys who can win this thing they've proven: Federer, Novak Djokovic. And this will be the first time they play since 2016. If we are so lucky, if they both win one more match tonight. If we get that match, it'll be the first time at the Australian Open they play since 2016, since before Federer had his knee operation, since before the Neo backhand, since before Federer proved he can still win in the Australian Open. So, of course, we want to see that match. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about all the quarterfinals and what I think is going to happen. But first, I've got to talk. I beg your indulgence. I've got to talk just a little bit about Kobe Bryant. Uh, Yesterday... And, and throughout this whole tournament, I've been talking about how important it is that we appreciate our legends while they're still around. And and I was talking about while they're still good enough to play at a high level and their careers are still going. Well, yesterday we got a really um, a big wake up call and a sad reminder that you never know when anyone can be taken away from us, can be taken away from this world. And not just famous people that you look up to, famous athletes like Kobe, Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, Serena, people that... Uh, athletes that influence millions of people and inspire around the world, not just them, but even your loved ones. So you know, take the time to appreciate life so much and, uh, and you know, let someone that you love know how you feel about them like today instead of tomorrow, because you never know what will happen and when life can be taken away from all of us. And all of us, uh, we had a big loss yesterday for Kobe Bryant and, and there was other people on the helicopter too. So let's not, let's not forget. There's a lot of sad people who, uh, who lost someone yesterday, including Kobe's daughter, very sadly, who, unfortunately, she had recently really got into basketball. And Kobe, if, if you see pictures of him teaching his daughter basketball, you see he had something really special with her, and it's really tragic that that got cut short. But yesterday, I, I made a tweet where I basically said, Kobe and tennis. One of the things I do every day of my life is uh, I, I tend to find ways to relate tennis to everything in life. And uh, so I thought it'd be cool to do that with Kobe's basketball career. And somebody retweeted me, and I can't remember their name. I'm sorry, but they retweeted me. And above it, they wrote, This is really cool because I love tennis and I know nothing about basketball. And now, thanks to this tweet, I feel like I really can understand and appreciate how special Kobe was to his sport, to basketball. And so I wanted to build on that with you today because I know many of you probably don't know anything about basketball. Well, real quick to give you immediate context, you might not know anything about basketball, but I'm sure you know the GOAT of basketball is Michael Jordan, the greatest of all time, Michael Jordan. And uh, Kobe Bryant would eventually, he's like Rafa, he started off as a 17-year-old in the league, he was setting all kinds of records, the first to do this and that at such a young age, and eventually he would score more total points than Michael Jordan in in career numbers But he never got to the major uh, numbers. So Michael Jordan had six rings. Kobe, he had one for each finger. He had five. And a big reason that was 
was because when he was about the same age that Rafa Nadal is today, he had a really serious injury. He blew out his Achilles, which I know Federer had the knee injury, but this is this is even on another level. This is really hard to come back from. And and this happened to him when he had five championships. He was only one away from Michael Jordan, which would have put him in a conversation where you could start to debate who's the greater player, Jordan or Kobe. But without getting to that number, unfortunately for Kobe, he did everything he could after that that season. And, uh, and he never got there. So in comparison to the big three, I'll go with Djokovic first. Djokovic actually had a little bit of a relationship. Take a look with Kobe Bryant. And, and he looked up to him. And when Djokovic went through his injury problems, he actually sought out the advice of Kobe Bryant. And, and Kobe basically was telling him you know, about how you get back to achieving greatness as a great athlete when you have to come back from a serious injury. And, uh, and I thought that was uh, that was really cool. And another thing I heard Chris Fowler say recently was he was talking about how of the big three, he's been around them and met them and he's been covering the sport for so long. He was amazed by Djokovic's tennis IQ and how obsessed he was with analyzing the sport. And Kobe Bryant was the equivalent of that with basketball, extremely high basketball IQ and could talk X's and O's of basketball all day long, obsessed with it, I'm sure. And he loved tennis too, Kobe Bryant. So I, I would have loved to to be a fly on the wall to hear Djokovic and Kobe talk about tennis and talk about getting back to greatness. Uh, another, I got a quote. I want to share a couple quotes with you from Kobe Bryant to make you understand his mindset because he had one of the best sports mindsets of all time, no doubt. Kobe said, talking about like the NBA equivalent of the next gen, he said, these young guys are playing checkers. I'm playing chess. And that immediately made me think about all the times I've seen Roger Rafa and Novak just completely dismantle next gen players and, and just make it look like they're on a level that those next-gen guys will not get to, at least not at this point of their career. They just can't even comprehend it. Kobe was like that when he was getting older and having to challenge all these up-and-coming young guys. Kobe, like Rafa, came into the age as a teenager, as a young boy, and was like immediately successful, just like Rafa. And one of the things Kobe was quoted as saying back then was, I don't want to be the next Michael Jordan. I want to be Kobe Bryant. And, and that reminds me so much of Rafa Nadal. Same with... Uh, you know, uh, all the injuries that Kobe had and the work ethic to keep coming back really reminds you of Rafa Nadal. And then finally, I wanted to tell you this, you know, Kobe, uh, Roger Federer is known for, you know, when a lot of tennis players get nervous, they start to spin their ball more. They don't hit their second serve or their first serve as hard. And Federer is known for going even harder, for hitting the ball bigger when he's going through trouble. And Kobe had this quote because he was the same way with, with basketball. He said, I'd rather go 0 for 30, talking about attempts, he'd rather miss 30 attempts before I would go 0 for 9. Because 0 for 9 means you beat yourself. You psych yourself out of the game. The only reason is because you've just now lost confidence in yourself. And that reminded me so much of Roger Federer, who would, uh, and the, all of the big three for that matter, Serena too. Uh, no matter what the situation is, you just go for it and you trust your talents. You trust your skills. You believe in yourself no matter what. Kobe Bryant, last word on Kobe, and then we'll get into the show. He was at the U.S. Open last year, and somebody had asked him, what do you have in, in common with uh, you know a great like you in basketball? What do you have in common with these tennis greats, these legends of the tennis game? And Kobe offered one word, obsession. Kobe recognized in the big three in Serena what he had all the years that he played, 20 years in the league. Kobe was completely obsessed with getting better and, and winning championships. And I think that's ultimately the saddest thing because Kobe was doing it with his daughter and lots of other uh, young kids. He was teaching them about the values of working hard, setting goals, working hard, and accomplishing your dreams, no matter how crazy your dreams may be. That's what Kobe was all about, and that's ultimately the saddest thing about yesterday, is that someone who was doing so much to inspire so many people to work hard and achieve their dreams, one of the most important things we can teach anyone in life, someone who was working so hard and had already done so much, was a taken away from all of us yesterday. So appreciate your legends and appreciate your loved ones, because you never know when someone can be taken away from this world. I got this. You trust your boy? That is how you jump over an Aston Martin, boy. Kobe. I literally just hit my first attempt at a fadeaway jump shot. That's amazing. Today on the show, we have to talk about weather, weather, weather conditions. 
because we have the weirdest, weirdest scenarios ever of all time at this year's Australian Open. So we'll talk about the conditions and how they will change for all of the remaining matches. Also, Milos Raonic, does he have a chance to take down Novak Djokovic? Well, there is one statistic that I think is very telling where we got to give him at least a little chance despite the fact that he's never done it. After all, I, I believe it was Brad Gilbert I heard say that Milos Raonic is playing the best out of everyone in the tournament that he's seen thus far. I know that sounds crazy, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I heard Brad, Brad Gilbert say that the other day. And also, Tennis Sandgren. What should we know about his game and why do I think he's kind of a special player? Believe it or not. We'll get into all that and nothing more on today's edition of Coffee Break Tennis. All right, I have literally spent hours and hours looking at weather conditions, looking at different times. I don't think anyone in the world has spent as much time looking ahead in the tournament as I have to talk about conditions because we have a very unique situation here. And and I wish we had more time on today's show to talk all about Kyrgios and Nadal because that was a, a heck of a match. But I don't think we have time, so maybe we'll talk a little bit about that later. I'm mainly going to talk about all the matches that are coming because uh, put it on the screen. We've got our quarterfinals set, and let's start off with the matches tonight. So... I have a very strong theory. For all the talk we've heard in the past of preferential treatment for Federer, the, the way the temperatures have been dropping so unseasonally low for Australia this summer, I mean, it's just crazy. Roger Federer has had more of these night matches with the high humidity and the low temperatures than anyone else, like all these players left in the quarterfinals. Federer has been in these t conditions every match he's played thus far, except for the first one with Steve Johnson. I think that was a day match. But even that match had the roof closed and it had been raining that day. So he still didn't get to enjoy like a hot day. Like when, when Rafa beat Pablo Correna Busta, he had uh, he had the perfect kind of conditions that he would like to hit. That was one of the hottest days of the tournament and, and, Rafa, and relatively low humidity. But everything else has been really high humidity at the night. And so I wanted to go through a couple things. And I even dug up because I'd been after Federer's match with Millman and especially when it was even more humid and I think temperatures... We're about the same for the Fuchovic match. The temperature hit 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which I, I think is 16 C or something like that. Thanks to uh, Monica and Damien, they've been trying to help me uh, translate. They've been telling me different temperatures in C. So I wrote down a few times in case you don't know Fahrenheit at all. But you'll know 77%. That was the Fuchovic match humidity at 9 p.m. Uh, that is ridiculous humidity. And I played a match back in November where I was uh, winning, or at least we were tied at a set apiece, and going into the third set, I lost 6-0, and even considered like having to quit the match, because I was playing, and I had to look this up. There's a really cool website where you can look in the past and see what the weather was on different dates. And I knew that weather, I remembered that weather being cold. It was 50 degrees that night that I was playing, and I played a guy, you know, think like a John Millman type, this guy was faster than me and younger than me and had more endurance than me and didn't hit the ball as big as me, but was getting to everything. And I just couldn't hit the ball with him. And even though it was 50 degrees, I remember just being so exhausted and, and even like cramping after the match was over. And I was just shocked because typically you, that only happens in the hot summer, not in November when it's 50 degrees at night. And I looked back and saw that my match with a guy named Mayank, it was 50 degrees. This is around the time of the start, so it might have even got lower. And 74% humidity, which I'm sure went up even higher, probably into the low 80s. And in that match, I'll never forget, I couldn't hit a winner. And I was just uh, so exhausted having to hit that ball so hard to try to get it past this guy. My best shot is backhand up the line. And I remember there was one backhand I just freaking crushed up the line. And this guy ran over there and squash shot it with his forehand and got it back. And that was the moment, as tired as I felt in that moment, where I knew, like, there's just no way I'm going to win. There's there's literally nothing I can do. And and that was one of the few matches where I actually considered giving up because um I knew that I, I had nothing left. And I was looking at my iWatch, my Apple Watch, and I was repeatedly hitting, like, 180, 190 beats per minute heart rate. And it's 50 degrees outside. You know, how does someone working that hard? Well, that's the humidity. That's, and that's the slowness of the court from cold plus humidity and playing against someone who's got great defense. And Federer has had to do that. Roger Federer has had to do that this tournament this year more than anybody else. Rafa got a great taste of that last night. So if we look at the conditions, Rafa last night with Kyrgios, it looked like they hit as low as 60 degrees Fahrenheit 
And something like 70, towards the end of the match, I think they even went as high as 80% humidity. That's the same kind of numbers I was playing in, uh, the temperature a little bit warmer. And, and for those of you in, in Europe and the rest of the world, that's 16C, I believe, somewhere around there. So uh, pretty cold. And you saw Rafa. I, I got to tell you, that match, even though it was only four sets, it probably took a lot out of him. And that's why I'm going to go ahead and predict that Rafa does not make the final. Because to me, if we look at 2019, when Rafa you know, wins, when he goes to the Australian Open final last year, I think Rafa drops no sets. He doesn't drop a single set, and he plays so much offense that he doesn't have to exert himself. And he goes all the way to the final, and then he gets crushed by Djokovic. Uh, last year, when Rafa wins the U.S. Open... I believe he only drops one set en route to the final. So no one really worked him super hard. And then we saw how, you know, it was tough for him to get over the finish line in that five-set match in the final with Medvedev. But if we look at 2018, and that's why I thought Rafa wouldn't make it to the finals of the Australian Open and the U.S. Open on the hard courts last year because after 2018, I didn't have faith in Rafa's body holding up throughout all the battling on a hard court major. Because Rafa... In the round of 16 at the Australian Open two years ago, he played Diego Schwartzman, and he, and he dropped one set, but you know uh, he had to play a tie break, and he dropped a set, and, and that was a, a tough match. And then when he had to go five with Marin Cilic, that was too much, no moss, uh, and he ultimately, and the funny thing is, it was the same exact score. You know, Nadal had that score at Wimbledon last time he played Kyrgios, same ex- exact score, credit to Kyrgios for somehow breaking back in the final set. Same exact score, uh, 6-3, 3-6, 7-6, 7-6. So Nadal was up in the quarterfinals 2018 of the Australian Open against Marin Cilic, who was in championship form that year, came pretty close to winning it, losing the Federer in the final. He had won the first set against Cilic back then, 6-3, lost the second, 3-6, won the third set, 7-6, and a tiebreak. Everything is exactly the same as the Kyrgios scoreline. And then in the fourth set, he didn't go to a tiebreak. He lost 6-2 because it was obvious that Nadal wasn't moving right and something was seriously wrong, down 2-0 in the fifth set. Nadal, no moss, he couldn't go on. And then, don't forget the epic with Dominic Team, and I think that was the quarterfinals. And then in the semifinals, two years ago, U.S. Open 2018, won Martin Del Potro, who, God, we haven't talked about it this week at all. Del Potro, it's looking like uh, he might be retiring and ending his career. Sad to hear that. But Del Potro got the benefit of Nadal having to pull out of the match. I think in the second set, Del Potro... He got the win because Nadal couldn't go anymore. His body was too beat up from the hard courts. When Rafa has really tough matches on hard courts, it it really hurts his chances. And I know he got through Kyrgios in four, but you can see it from the box last night. It is mentally draining for the whole team. Everyone in Nadal's team, in the player box, and Nadal himself, uh, it is a tall task to take on Nick Kyrgios for them. They all don't like that matchup for obvious reasons. You know, you watched in that match... That uh, Kyrgios in the first set, he didn't have the right mix of, you know, his drop shots weren't making it, and and his and his backhand was misfiring a lot, and so he lost that first set. But by the second set, Kyrgios found the balance of he's hitting the power to push Nadal back, and then he's hitting drop shots good enough to take advantage of the court positioning. And then, you know, like Federer, uh, Nick is showing the drop shot coming to net and then pushing it deep as like a slice approach into the corner, and then Nadal's already running forwards to the drop shot and then having to back up. So you see all the reasons why Nick Kyrgios can really give Rafa a really hard time. So I got to tell you, I think this was very physically and emotionally draining on Rafa Nadal. And that's why if we put the draw on the screen again, I'm going to go with Rafa actually finding it. I think he has enough left to beat Dominic Team. I will say Rafa advances, but I will not be shocked at all if it is like that quarterfinal at the U.S. Open two years ago and it takes everything out of Rafa. And believe it or not, I see a, a really clear path for Sasha Zarev to go to the final. I know that sounds freaking crazy, but here's how I see it happening. Stan Favrinka will give him a shot because we don't know. He's had so many issues physically with the, the knees, and we don't know if Stan can come back having gone five sets and then beat Sasha Zverev, who's serving really well, even though Sasha Zverev, he's had the easiest draw up to this point of everyone. Give him credit because we've seen him ruin opportunities before where he's got a, a, a decent draw and should win matches and doesn't at the Grand Slams. But, you know, Sasha Zarev, he has proven himself, even though it's a curse to win the World Tour Finals, he proved himself there that he can take on top players. And, and, and then he just beat the heck out of Nadal 
on that court. This court, especially the way it is, uh, it, it's playing kind of similar. And as, as things speed up, Sasha Zverev's got to feel comfortable on this court at the Australian Open. And I, I feel like he should be able to beat Stan Vavrinka. I don't think Stan Vavrinka is, is going to be able to do it after the five sets. But we don't know for sure because this is, uh, you know, Stan is untested. He hasn't fully proven himself since all the issues he's had with his body. So we give Stan a shot for sure. But I think Sasha Zverev has a reasonable expectation to win that match if he if he keeps serving well, even though he hasn't really faced anyone who's a great returner. And, and Rublev was clearly just out of gas. The guy won like 15 matches in a row. The problem with winning that much is uh, you're going to run out of energy. And I think that's the the problem. Plus, uh, Sasha Zverev, they're friendly. They know each other from childhood. And um, Sasha Zverev has, has won every time they've played. So a lot of things going for him there. But Vrinka could be tough. I don't know if Vrinka has it in him to do it again. If Sasha Zverev makes it through, I think he's in a semifinal, very likely with a Rafa Nadal who's physically compromised. And that's why I give Sasha Zverev a real chance to make it to the final. This is as good as it's going to get anytime soon for him at least. Whereas on the bottom, you got Federer and Tennis Sandgren. And Tennis Sandgren, you know, he, he actually seems like a really nice guy when you listen to his press conference. I, I wanted to play this clip for you really quick. Just take a listen. There are better players than me that <clears throat> that I played with in Futures and Challengers that have stopped playing because they just ran out of money or, or got injured or something like that. So the fact that I was blessed enough to uh, keep hold of my dream and to be able to try and fulfill it. What would you think of playing better or not? <laughs> <laughs> it would be very special. Very special. It would be incredibly special to be able to play him at least once in my career, and to play him on a, on a big stage, like quarters of a slam. So this soundbite of Tennis Sandgren I find very interesting because, one, his story is pretty cool, and I think it's, you know, he's a special person. Like, he talked about there's a lot of players that he played with in the minor leagues who were a lot better than him but didn't make it because they ran out of money, they got hurt, whatever. And the fact that, you know, Tennis Sandgren feels so fortunate to be here and that he stuck it out and achieved his dreams, I think that's really cool. That's a great story. The other thing that this soundbite tells me is that he doesn't believe he can beat Roger Federer. Now, he has a great record in majors against players ranked much higher than him, but this is where the conditions come back into play. Roger Federer has played more of these horribly humid, cold, slow, as Roger said, it's a bit frosty. Uh, and I know he was joking, but I think he was talking about, you know, he said, that's how we want it. Obviously, he, he said in press, especially in Swiss press, some of the stuff Roger said, about how slow it is, and he even, there's a great line in the Swiss press where uh, Roger says in Swiss German that he felt like the match with Fuchovic was like playing PlayStation tennis because when the balls in these slow conditions get beat up and fluffed up, he said you, you can't do anything with spin or slice anymore, the ball just doesn't take it, it's too dead, and the ball's so flat that you're just hitting it back and forth like PlayStation tennis, like it's a video game, and he said that, you know, that's really boring. And when that happens, you just flatten it out and really just try to hit it deep. And that was ultimately what he did against Fuchovic after losing that first set. Major credit to Federer because such slow, humid conditions that night to get through that match. He's, he just had to hit the ball harder and get it deeper and kind of back Fuchovic up, who was really dictating play in the first set. And Federer was able to push him back off the baseline and, and make, him, make him play a little more defensive and things started falling apart for him. But my point was, you know, in these super slow conditions... Roger was really lucky to get through Fuchovic in straight sets really quickly after losing the first set. And now he has a really golden opportunity to go feeling pretty fresh to the semifinals because the conditions are going to be a lot faster than what he's used to comparatively in the day session today, uh, tonight for us on the East Coast here in the United States. So today, the day session, we're looking at 73 degrees Fahrenheit and 47% humidity. And, and Roger's playing night matches with 60, 70, even 80% humidity. So to drop to 47, that's still slower tennis conditions, especially compared to what you usually would see in Australia at the Australian Open in Melbourne. But, but th this is going to be a lot faster. And I feel like Tennis Sandgren would be dangerous. He's a bit of a road runner. He's going to get to everything like Milman, like Fuchovic was playing great defense. And I feel he's got like a little more firepower, a little more X factor there. And plus, we see how good he is at the slams, and he likes playing here in Australia. And now that the conditions are going to be a little faster for Federer, I feel like it's it's easier for Federer to get through in three sets and not struggle to find ways to hit the ball past Sandgren. I think Federer is going to be able to figure out a way to come through it. Don't get me wrong. Let's not totally underestimate Tennis Sandgren. 
I, I think there is another nightmare scenario where Federer goes four or five sets and then goes into a Djokovic match with uh, not enough in the tank. It's possible, but luckily, if Federer had played the night match, I think that's much more likely to all go wrong for Roger and lose or be playing four or five sets, a long battle in the humidity. But no, that's going to be Raonic and Djokovic because by the time they play, we're moving up to, you know, uh, you're looking at 24C is the height, if you don't know Fahrenheit, you know Celsius for Federer and Sandgren's match. And maybe a 49% looks like the highest humidity they will have to deal with, even if their match goes like three hours long. Much better for Federer than what he's been dealing with. Much faster and less, um, it's not going to drain you like I felt in my match, hitting in 75%, 80% humidity. And I'm sure Rafa felt this way with Kyrgios, having to just crush the freaking ball. I'm telling you, it's going to take a lot out of Rafa, even though he came through in four sets. And for Roger... I think it's going to be a lot easier. But Djokovic, who's mostly played day sessions, right? He's the big name who plays the same day as Federer. Federer's pretty much played all night matches except for Stevie Johnson. Djokovic has pretty much played all day session matches. Djokovic is going to start tonight. And we're looking at something like 29 dropping down to 19 C for the Celsius people out there. And for the Fahrenheit, we're looking at like 69 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe dropping lower to 65, 64. And we got humidity starting off for Djokovic. At 58, so about 10% higher than what Federer and Sandgren will be dealing with from the go, from the start of the match. And we're we're talking about if this match goes until 10 p.m., 74%. That That's my match that I had in November that made it impossible to hit the ball past the guy. And, and that's, uh, that's what Federer's been dealing with in his night matches when it's so slow. Uh, Djokovic hasn't seen conditions like that at this tournament. And Milos Raonic, here's a cool stat on Raonic that you might not know. So I think Federer has an advantage because Sandgren last year on on average, he only won 15% of return games to compare that to greats. Federer last year on hard courts won 26.4% of his uh, return games. Djokovic 31.5. Someone like Isner is like 9%, right? His game is all about holding serve. Well, Raonic is at 13.2%. So that's even worse than Sandgren's break rate. And you might say, so, you know Djokovic is the greatest returner. He's going to break Raonic. How is Raonic going to break Djokovic? But one thing I think is very interesting is when you look at versus the top 10 servers, top 10 ranked players, Djokovic return win percentage, return games won, drops from 31.5 to 26.4. So a full 5.1% drop. Uh, Federer, he drops from 26.4 to 21.8. So almost 5% drop off on how often... They win on return games against top 10 players. Obviously, the quality of serve goes up. Well, the interesting thing for Raonic is uh, he's one of the few players who does better returning. Now, it didn't go up a lot. He averages 13.2% return against everyone else on tour. But when he plays top 10 players, Raonic, you know, he's got firepower on that forehand. And that's where I, I see this coming from. And and take a listen. This is Djokovic really quick. Take a listen to a clip. Djokovic talking about returning Raonic's serve. The challenges of playing Raonic versus Isner and Karlovic because those three guys got three of the best serves around. I feel like Raonic uh, moves better than Isner and Karlovic. I mean, he's not as tall as these two guys. They're, you know, six foot ten, I think, or two two meters ten. I mean, they're the tallest players ever to play the tennis uh, sport. So um, obviously, it's a huge advantage when you hit serves from from that height. If you if the returner gets the the ball back in play then I think Raonic is um, better you know than than these two guys um, but I, f- I feel like you know maybe you could read his serve better than than Isner and Karlovic I don't want to say slightly slower but just a little bit of a different toss different technique again it's such a minor difference that you you don't really notice it so much but uh, on the court it makes it makes a big difference so Djokovic is, is very correct there. One, the serve of Raonic is really close to the quality of those guys. And two, the movement is a lot better. Big difference, you know. And uh, Raonic going up, doing better against top 10, 13.6. And, and just to give you context, Isner against everyone else, he wins 9% of the time when returning serve. Compared when he is uh, playing only top 10 players, Isner drops to an incredibly low 1.2%. Raonic goes up to 13.6. That That's a huge deal to me. And I think 
that Roundish actually has a shot early on in the match when the conditions aren't super slow yet. Roundish has a shot to win a set, maybe two. By the end of the match, if Roundish does this, and it's asking a lot because Roundish has never beat Djokovic, but he's had close matches with Djokovic. If Roundish can force him to go late into the night, we're going to see crazy high humidity like the stuff you see with Federer Milman or Federer Fuchovic. And that's where I say Djokovic will win, but it could be four or five, and it could be physically demanding and brutal. And this is where Federer not playing the ATP Cup comes in with Djokovic singles and doubles in the ATP Cup. Nadal singles and doubles in the ATP Cup. If Djokovic and Nadal, and Nadal could have a real battle with Dominic team, if they get to the semifinals, I think they just have less gas in the tank than what we're used to expecting from them because we've never seen such a big event like the ATP Cup that's so demanding right before a major. We've never seen top players like Rafa, Roger, Novak exert so much right before a major. And that's why I think it is a game changer. And here's the biggest game changer of all. This is why I think Sasha Zverev could come through to the final. And why I also think Rafa could come through to the final with like nothing left. Semifinal day one, we're looking at 37 C, the low 33 C, 97, the low 74 in Fahrenheit for us. The humidity on average for the day, 33%. We're talking about the night conditions that Federer has found solutions in, ways to hit around tough opponents who defend really well, cutting that humidity in half. That is so drastically different. Plus, we're talking about almost 100 degrees Fahrenheit heat on both semifinal days. That's advantage Rafa if he gets through Dominic team. Uh, I still could see Sasha Zverev finding a way with the big serve to uh, to keep it out of reach if, if Nadal is so exhausted. I can also see Nadal getting to the final being just like literally having so very little left. And this is where Federer at the World Tour Finals beating Djokovic on a fast indoor court. Night matches, all the semifinals and finals, they all start at 7.30 p.m. local time. But even at night, it's like we're talking we're talking like 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit hotter even at night at the, the coldest moments of the night matches in the semifinals and cutting the humidity in half for both semifinals. That's why it's so valuable that Federer was able on a fast court to take it to Djokovic and play so aggressive, lights out, and get him. I think Federer can do it against Djokovic again, especially if Djokovic is coming off of an epic long match. I think Federer has a real opportunity playing in the day to come through Sandgren in three sets and have plenty left in the tank to beat Djokovic. And then here's the ultimate irony at all. This is the greatest news in the world for Federer fans because if he can get through and make the final, on finals Sunday at the Australian Open, the weather, after shooting up to hot with no humidity, it goes right back down to those night conditions that Federer has been playing with this whole entire tournament. Federer has got the most experience doing it thus far. If he is in the final with someone like a Rafa Nadal who's just so beat up after going through Dominic Team and Nick Kyrgios and whoever the heck he plays in the semifinal, or Sasha Zverev who's mostly played day matches as well, if Roger is in that final with terrible conditions, high humidity, uh, low temperatures, very slow conditions, and he's playing a Rafa whose forehand is like the lowest Federer's ever going to see that thing bouncing in these kind of conditions, or he plays a Sasha Zverev, I think advantage fed, he's going to deal with the conditions better than those guys because of what he went through with John Millman and what he went through with Fuchovic. And uh, hit the music because we're getting out of here. I, I mean, do you see where I'm going? Comment below. Is it just crazy enough? I really see this as a possibility. I know we're asking a lot of Roundage to either beat or really wear down Djokovic and make him go deep into the late night four or five sets with high humidity and terrible conditions. We're asking a lot, but if it happens and then the conditions completely change for Djokovic, so different, whereas Federer playing day session today, the conditions will be uh, kind of similar, maybe even a little bit faster. I'd say definitely faster with the lower humidity. I think Federer takes, takes that experience knowing in the right conditions he can beat Djokovic. He just proved it a couple months ago. I think Federer can do it for real. I'm not crazy. I really believe it. And you know what I think about the final as well. Uh, comment below what you think. We will be back tomorrow. We'll talk all about the matches. Hopefully we're talking Djokovic and Federer and X's and O's. And uh, last thing, last word on everything. Life is short. You never know what can happen. Appreciate your legends. Appreciate your loved ones. Appreciate every moment that we all have together on this great place, the planet Earth. See ya! That's just... And this is nothing, by the way. That's just body contact. This is... Very few guys that can play both hard and face the ball. I mean, you
you're not going to get into the head of Kobe Bryant. And when you have a pillow fight and somebody fakes a pillow at you, don't you at least flinch? Kobe Bryant, that's the play of the game. He didn't even flinch.